Good evening. Can I be heard on this glorious spring day in Las Vegas? Thank you all for coming out on, on such a great day. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. We're very happy to have you here tonight and uh, to deal with an important topic with, an, with international implications. And for those of you who've come to some of our talks before, we, we've talked about how Nevada and Las Vegas is in particular as a, as a growing global city has much as more at stake than ever before in some of these issues. So thank you. Uh, the Domenico's PowerPoint tonight will be up on our website tomorrow, so if that helps those of you who are note takers in the group, uh, you don't have to hurt yourselves tonight. We want you to pay attention to every word he has to say. And as always, we'll have the, the actual video of the lecture up on our website in a few days. Let me tell you a little bit about Domenico, and I, I want to read this because it's hard to believe it's true, but if, if it's on paper, maybe I'll believe <laughs> <laughs> Domenico is, is a senior fellow at Brookings, but he's president of the Oxford Institute on Economic Policy. He's a member of the Financial Times Forum of Economists. He's previously been a member of the executive boards of both the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And as you can see by his topic tonight, his academic interests focus on the global economy and currencies, global governance, the G20, the G8, and European economies in general. He has an undergraduate degree in financial economics from Bocconi University in Milan, and he's done postgraduate studies at Harvard, the London School of Economics, and Oxford University, where he holds his PhD. Earlier this week, we were discussing the architectural similarities between Las Vegas and Oxford University. <laughs> <laughs> That was a very brief conversation. <laughs> but, uh, about, it's Domenico's first trip to Las Vegas, like all our scholars. He's been meeting with students in the classroom, with, our, with faculty members, both economics, political science, and other disciplines. So it, it's a treat to hear him tonight. I'm going to turn the stage over to Domenico Lombardi. Thank you very much, Bill, for your very generous introduction. Uh, <clears throat> It's a pleasure to be here and uh, you know, I'm very serious. Uh, this is the second time in a row that I applied to come here. The first time didn't work and I'm so glad that this time you know, I was offered this opportunity. And this is an incredibly popular program at the Brookings Institution. I have many of uh, the best colleagues uh, who come here and uh, who look forward to come here every year. So, really, thank you so much for hosting me and for giving me this opportunity. So, what I uh, I'm going to do tonight is essentially to highlight uh, a little bit what's, uh, what's been going on in Europe, in the Eurozone. And uh, what I'd like to start with is essentially, you know, we're here in Las Vegas, so why do we care about what happens in, in the Eurozone, about what happens in, uh, in the tiny island of Cyprus, 0.2% of the Eurozone GDP, or, you know, in Greece, less than 2% of the Eurozone GDP. And the same is true for Portugal, for Ireland. But maybe it's not true for larger economies of the Eurozone, like Italy or Spain. Italy with a uh, public debt stock of uh, over 2 trillion euros. And uh, the same applies to Spain, not uh, in terms of the public debt that uh, Spain has, but more in terms of the contingent liabilities linked to its shaky financial sector. So let me, uh, let me start just by highlighting you know, the structure of this uh, uh, conversation more than a lecture, really. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the systemic relevance of the Eurozone. So why should we care? Uh, just in, in the hope to stimulate your, your interest. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to, uh, to go back to the origins. and. Um, just to uh, uh, show you a couple of slides highlighting the great expectations that many countries had when the euro was introduced in the late 90s. At that time, I was uh, uh, you know, a much younger economist uh, working for the Italian Central Bank, and I was involved in the preparations for uh, you know, my country joining the eurozone, and uh, partly because I was young, uh, partly because this was seen as uh, an historical project, an historical venture, 
uh, clearly we all, we all had uh, great expectations. Uh, somehow these expectations didn't, weren't really fulfilled, were not really fulfilled. And uh, I'm going to go through, you know, fiscal, competitiveness, structural policies, trying to highlight some of the common flows in terms of explaining the euro area crisis. And also what I think, uh, drawing on the research done not just by myself, but by my colleagues in the Global Economy Program at the Brookings Institution, uh, on what could be the remedies uh, going forward. And um, I hope to have you know, really an open discussion with you uh, to, to really discuss this way forward. It's such a complex topic. Uh, there is really no one size fits all approach. It's uh, really so unique, this crisis, that uh, you know, you you, 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 couldn't have, uh, you couldn't have read about it in any textbook because it's really unique in many, in many respects. Uh, so why do we care? After all, if you look at the population of the Eurozone, uh, you know, uh, at the start of uh, uh, the single currency area in 1999, was slightly over 5% of world population. As you can see, it has been declining steadily and uh, now it's uh, less than 4.8%. And this is a very downward uh, uh, sloping curve, clearly reflecting uh, uh, you know, an aging population, um, a sort of demographics, uh, demographics dynamics that clearly does not hinge well for the Eurozone. But uh, the point is, you know, it was uh, a little bit over 5% at the start, and now it has been steadily declining. So, why should we care after all? Well, as it turns out, uh, if we look at the GDP of the Eurozone uh, at market prices, uh, so essentially in a unit of Euros, um, it was about 22% uh, when the Euro was introduced. Then it went a little bit uh, uh, up and down. But what we noticed is that, you know, following the great crisis of 2007, 2008, uh, the uh, share of uh, uh, GDP, of Eurozone GDP over world GDP has been declining, but it still, uh, you know, it still accounts for a 15, 14%. So it, it's quite relevant. And uh, you can uh, reinforce the argument by saying, this is just the Eurozone. This is just the 17 countries that share the single currency and clearly excludes, you know, an important country like the United Kingdom, which is part of the European Union, although it doesn't share the single currency. And clearly you can make the argument that uh, whatever happens to the Eurozone, of course, uh, has systemic implications for the larger economies like uh, the UK uh, as well. This is uh, just to convince you that uh, you know, the Eurozone has a systemic relevance from a GDP uh, viewpoint. This is the GDP at the purchasing power uh, parity. This is, uh, you know, a different way of accounting for the GDP that uh, in a way privileges the contribution to the world economy by developing, by developing countries. So, you know, you see that uh, uh, the weight of the Eurozone is uh, slightly lower, rightly, you know, about 12% in, uh, in the case of the GDP and market prices. Uh, it is uh, slightly higher uh, and that's because uh, you know, in, uh, if you use this uh, matrix, developing countries account for a larger share. But in any case, whatever matrix you use, you come up with a significant weight nonetheless. And again, if we look at uh, the Eurozone trade, uh, uh, you know, as a percentage of world trade, uh, in a way, uh, you know, the weight uh, is uh, uh, even more relevant. It started at, uh, at about 30-31% in 99, and then again it went up and down. Uh, now that uh, the global economy uh, is not doing uh, greatly, uh, still it is above uh, 27%. Uh, and uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, we all read the papers, of course, uh, uh, in the press, and uh, you know, whenever we hear that China, the Chinese economy is slowing down, one of the reasons that is uh, um, you know, po pointed to is uh, really the slowing down of the Eurozone and of the European market in general. Because this Europe is, not just the Eurozone, the whole European Union 
is the largest export market for China as well as the United States. And uh, uh, this is, uh, in the end, really why, why we should care. Just one more reason. Uh, we are here in the United States, and uh, the legal tenure here is the US dollar, which also happens to be the reserve currency, the currency that uh, everybody abroad uses for you know, international transactions. But uh, although the dollar is the reserve currency, also the euro you know, is, is still uh, largely used, although it is uh, a reserve currency second to the dollar. Again, if we look at the uh, euro-denominated assets held by banks, held by banks, um, this, uh, you know, in the first years following the introduction of the euro, there was an exponential growth. Then it went a little bit up and down, following the crisis, it went slightly down, but still it accounts for a, a quite a larger share of uh, um, uh, bank holdings. And then, you know, really besides any uh, quantitative metrics, I would say why the, why the Eurozone crisis is relevant? Well, because it is really a unique experiment in the world. Uh, you know, you have uh, these countries that have uh, fought each other for centuries. Uh, you know, I had, of course, uh, my grandfathers who have been at war, not just the first, but also the second. Um, and uh, here you have, you know, younger generations who study, you know, a French student who studies in Germany. Um, they can uh, work freely. They can uh, um, uh, essentially, uh, you know, use the same currency. And, uh, uh, you know, this is something that uh, has really uh, provided a benchmark for many other countries in other regions to look at, to build on, and to leverage on. So really, the now you know, with this crisis and the successes, but also now the failures, it's important to understand the nature of these failures, because it doesn't mean necessarily that countries should not integrate from a regional perspective. Uh, of course, you know, there is really a lot of uh, gains from uh, Canada and the United States, you know, to integrate with each other. Uh, but maybe, you know, we want to be better aware of the um, potential as well as, you know, the failures that uh, could come uh, with regional integration. Until uh, the Eurozone crisis struck, there was the idea, at least in Europe, that uh, Europe and European integration was a one-way bet. That, uh, you know, by integrating you would resolve uh, all the problems. Uh, not just economic problems, but also governance problems. Take the case of my own country, Italy, where I, where I come from. Um, you know, clearly it's difficult to, to form a cabinet. Uh, it's diffi difficult to pass a law. But, you know, many of the uh, reforms that the country has introduced over time owe a lot, owe a lot to Europe, owe a lot to uh, Brussels, to um, you know, the directives that uh, have been uh, coming from, from Brussels. So, um, uh, really, uh, there is a lot uh, to, um, to be sort of, uh, to acknowledge, but uh, nonetheless, we have also to be aware of the failures in order first to save this project and also for other countries to uh, sort of share the benefits of financial integration without uh, necessarily going through the same failures. So, you know, we're telling at the start uh, there were great, great expectations. And, uh, you know, one way I thought I would measure these great expectations was to uh, take the IMF projections for GDP growth, you know, following the introduction of the euro, and compare those projections with the uh, realized uh, growth rate. And what you can see, again, you don't need to be an econometrician, uh, to see that uh, the projections in the, you know, the, the uh, green line, they systematically, almost systematically, outperform the realized growth rate. If you take the case of Italy, this is even more evident. Uh, again, you have the forecasted growth rate for Italian GDP 
and you see the distance. Sorry, you see the distance between uh, the um, the uh, projections as well as the realization of growth over time. And uh, I mean, this is 2009. That's uh, you know the great uh, contraction. Um, Italy doesn't have a particularly sophisticated financial sector. And, and therefore, many thought it would be immune, or in any case, the spillovers from the international financial crisis would be contained. But look at globalization. Uh, Italy experienced a contraction of 5.5% uh, of GDP. Uh, the US, where the crisis originated in the same year, experienced a contraction of 3.2%. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an order of magnitude. But uh, you know, one good thing, uh, certainly the euro, uh, the euro produced, uh, that's uh, the convergence on uh, government bond yields. Uh, look, in the case of Greece, this is stunning. Greece uh, uh, was paying uh, almost 18% of interest rate on uh, its government bond yields. And you know, when uh, Greece joined the Eurozone, essentially they almost converged with uh, the yields of Germany. And to, to, the to some extent, uh, this is also true for Spain, for Italy, although you know, it's uh, uh, less pronounced. But you do have the same pattern here of uh, bond yields essentially converging on the lower bound of German uh, uh, government bond uh, uh, interest rates. And uh, of course, you know, the, the uh, chart stops at 2007 because from uh, that year onwards, this is no longer true. <laughs> <laughs> and this is part of the problem why I'm here tonight. So, you know, if you read the, the press, especially the German press, there is always this attitude that, uh, you know, Southern Europeans, uh, overspend. So I thought maybe that may could be true. Let me look at some basic statistics. And this is, you know, the indicator, this is uh, debt over GDP. So the public debt over, uh, um, uh, over GDP, or over income. Uh, you know, again, if you take the case of Italy, Italy joined the Eurozone with a debt to GDP ratio of uh, less than 110%. I mean, still very high. Then there is a little bit of a downward trend. Sorry, I mean, that's too, that's really sensitive. Um, so uh, there was a little bit of a downward trend. And then, you know, look at what happens, you know, starting from 2009. You remember, this is the year I told Italy experienced an unprecedented contraction of 5.5% of income. Uh, you know, so the debt to GDP uh, becomes much higher. And then look again at what happens between uh, 2011 and 2012. In, in only a year, there is an increase of six percentage points. And please do recall you know, this difference, six percentage points. Uh, because this is going to be important for the next two slides. Um, when you look at the fiscal deficit, this is, this is clearly you know, the difference between uh, revenues and expenditures. You know, just uh, uh, I'm simplifying a bit. So you do see that uh, you know, Germany is clearly the virtuous country. Um, but it fails to comply with the Maastricht Treaty in more than a year. One of the constraints posed by the so-called Maastricht Treaty is that countries cannot run a deficit over GDP greater than 3% each year. So Germany overall has been quite virtuous. However, it breaks the constraint in 2002, 2004, 2005 and of course in 2010 and 9. So Italy breaks the, this ceiling almost every year. 
but uh, you know the other countries do not do not do much better, uh, especially in the later part of the decade. Look at Spain; it was very virtuous, you know, in the first half of the decade, and then look at what happens following the international financial crisis. Uh, just to put uh, things in perspective, the uh, deficit uh, to GDP ratio for the United States in this year, 2009, was in the tune of 13%. Um, this is the uh, structural uh, balance over GDP. Essentially, it's the same measure we have looked at before, but it takes into account uh, the economic cycle. So it is a, essentially, it, it is a more appropriate measure to gauge the extent of the fiscal deficit uh, because, you know, clearly, uh, because it incorporates the, the effect of the, um, of the uh, economic cycle. So look at here. Um, you can see very clearly that uh, starting from the middle of uh, last decade, there is, you know, an attempt to, uh, sorry, to bring the uh, deficit down. And in particular, from uh, 2011 and 2012, there is a fiscal contraction, fiscal consolidation of almost three percentage point worth of GDP on a structural basis. Um, so, I mean, would you conclude that uh, you know countries like Italy or you know France were they overspending? I mean, I wouldn't really say so. What is really, what is really important to notice is that here they were fiscally consolidating, they were axing the budget by three percentage points of GDP on a structural basis in a single year. And look what happened in terms of the debt to GDP ratio. So they axed the budget deficit of three percentage points. And the debt to GDP ratio increases by six percentage points. Essentially, it's worse than a catch-22. Why is that? Because essentially, growth is in free fall. And there is a steady contraction going on. So maybe, because really the, fiscal the potential fiscal unsustainability of larger debtors, like for instance Italy, is mainly driven by lack, by lack of growth. Maybe the point is how you can, uh, uh, how you, can uh, you know, encourage growth prospects. It's not really the budget, although of course there is a lot of room for improving the budget as well. But just you know, in terms of priority. Um, if we look at, if we look at, uh, if we try to uh, probe a little bit further into the structural factors. I think it's important looking at you know, the, export team, uh, the export performance of uh, the main Eurozone countries. Um, and you know, the idea was that uh, with the introduction of the Euro, there would be you know, a momentum on reforms. These countries would benefit from the single currency and would enjoy more export opportunities. By enjoying more export opportunities, uh, symmetrically, they would also import more. So there would, there would be more specialization, more, uh, more effective division of labor, efficiency gains. Uh, in a way, you know, everybody would gain from this. Look at Italy. Uh, you know, it start, uh, if you measure exports and imports, so the export is the um, green uh, bar, the imports is the purple bar. You know, it started off at about uh, uh, 27% of GDP or so in 2000. And it has stayed you know, pr pretty constant between the 27-30% uh, threshold. If you look at Spain, again, if anything, you know, the, the, the export ratio uh, is stay very close, stays very close to the 30% threshold. Um, for France, it actually decreases. 
Now look at Germany. So this, the Germans start off with, uh, say, a 35% uh, export uh, to GDP ratio and import to GDP ratio. Very symmetrical, by the way. Um, and look at this, you know, they end up the decade with an export ratio of 50%, although also the import ratio, you know, increases. But, uh, you know, th their export performance has been really, you know, quite spectacular. Uh, again, you can, uh, you know, summarize the same, uh, the same conclusion by looking at the uh, degree of openness, uh, was showing the export and import ratios separately. In this case, I'm uh, summing up both, uh, and I'm summing uh, uh, import and export, dividing them over GDP. And look at here, again, Germany started with uh, a degree of openness, uh, you know, really at the start of the single currency, uh, of almost 70%, it is now close to 100%. No one, no other country, not even the UK, which is a very open economy, um, uh, really exhibited, uh, has exhibited the same, the same performance. So, so Germany was uh, increasing, uh, you know, its export quite a lot. So, you know, one question could be, where, I mean, which country or where are, you know, um, German exports going to? And essentially what you see is that uh, mainly uh, the Germans have been exporting not to the Eurozone, but outside of the Eurozone. And uh, so they originally, you know, at the start of the single currency, they were exporting uh, a bit more than 45% of their exports to Eurozone countries. So it, it goes up and down, but there is a, a steady negative trend. And then, uh, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, it ends at 42%. So, and I think this, this graph really holds the key. So, this is the current account balance. So just to simplify, it's the difference between export and imports over, over GDP. And this is the, you know, the left uh, scale is uh, the relevant scale for, for, this, uh, uh, for this line. Look at this. They start, they, uh, you know, um, enter the single currency and it's just a steady upward line. Uh, there is a peak in 2007. Then, of course, they uh, are hit by the crisis, but they manage to, to, keep, you know, to keep the current account surplus at uh, a relatively higher level. And what happens to the currency? Because, of course, remember from uh, 1999, the Germans have given up uh, the Deutsche Mark, so they have a single currency. Well, the current account surplus increases, but what happens to the currency? It depreciates. I mean, that's not something, that's not even China that, you know, is able to do that. Um, so, wh why is that? Because clearly, you know, the euro is a common currency, is a sort of weighted currency. Therefore, you know, you have a sort of, whenever you have a weighted uh, average, you know, there are the good and the bad, if, you know, we may want to use this term. And of course, you know, other countries who are less competitive, uh, who are less well uh, performing, clearly help to keep the euro down. And the Germans have been very effective at leveraging, you know, on this um, implicit subsidy. You know, here in the US, I, I've been living in Washington DC for the latest 12 years. And clearly, you know, if you live in Washington, uh, you keep hearing about, uh, you know, frictions uh, between the US and China on the exchange rate. Now it is less so, but uh, uh, this is a very, uh, uh, there, there were times when it was a really a hot topic in Washington. But, you know, look at this uh, uh, spectacular trend. The current account surplus increases and the exchange rate depreciates, the best of whole worlds. And again, if you are looking for more evidence, uh, you know, I aggregated uh, the current account balances of the Northern Eurozone economies, 
So this includes, uh, you know, um, Austria, Finland, Germany, the Netherlands, the uh, northern European countries who, who, sh who share the uh, single currency. Uh, and, uh, you know, there is uh, really uh, a very clear trend. What we do see is that, however, the southern economies, uh, you know, have been, uh, uh, they initially ran, you know, a current account deficit. This deficit uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, approaching a balance, but still there is a very, uh, you know, high uh, current account surplus. Why is that? Because, as I said, many of the, the exports increasingly are towards non-Eurozone countries. So, in particular, you know, emerging, emerging economies. And, uh, you know, just to reinforce the point I was making before, uh, this is Germany and this is China. Uh, so there was a time where, you know, China was outperforming Germany in terms of a current account surplus, but now it's the other way around and no one seems to have noticed it. However, because Germany is part of the Eurozone, you know, the single currency area has a balanced uh, current account. So the IMF says this is not an issue because the current account of the Eurozone is balanced. So, um, so we have seen that Germany has been very effective at you know, taking advantage of the single currency, partly because you know, this link between uh, uh, increasing current account surplus and exchange rate appreci appreciation uh, is broken. Um, uh, so normally when you have a current account surplus, the exchange rate should appreciate to compensate for the surplus, <coughs> to bring the surplus down. In the case of Germany, we have seen that this is uh, not the case. Actually, the exchange rate seems to support an increasing, uh, uh, an increasing surplus. And we have also seen that uh, Germany has been able to increase its export in a, a more meaningful way than uh, you know, other European countries have done. So wh wh why is that? Uh, um, I mean, this is France, and uh, you know, we see that labor costs have uh, constantly increased over time, but labor productivity, I mean, has not really increased by, by much. And the same is true, the same story is true for Italy. In a way, it's worse because, again, labor, cost, labor compensation has been increasing since the start of the Eurozone, but productivity has been pretty flat. And the same is true for Spain, of course. But again, look at Germany. So they've managed to uh, to keep labor productivity increase at more or less a similar pace of uh, you know, labor compensation. And in any case, the growth of labor compensation of, uh, the, the growth of labor compensation has not been of the same magnitude than in the other <coughs> Eurozone countries. So they have been very effective in uh, uh, you know, taking advantage, yes, of some institutional feature of the Eurozone. Uh, a hidden subsidy in the exchange rate, but they have also, you know, engineered reforms that other countries have not. And uh, clearly because, you know, because they are, they've been able to keep uh, productivity growing, but also, you know, labor costs under control, they have uh, um, engineered a growth in competitiveness, what economists call competitiveness, that has uh, resulted in their export being more competitive vis-a-vis -vis other uh, Eurozone countries. And uh, you know, this is uh, captured by the Unilever cost, which is a standard measure that economists uh, use to uh, probe this, uh, uh, this argument. So uh, now, given that uh, this is a fact that uh, Clearly, uh, the southern economies have quite some homework to do, some catch-up to do. Uh, what, uh, what can the uh, southern, uh, what, what can the eurozone uh, engineer in order to bring more balance? So we said that uh, 
one of the issues why you know the Germans have been so successful at engineering their export growth is that they've been uh, extremely competitive. They've increased actually their competitiveness by uh, moderating uh, uh, um, wage, uh, wage growth and by uh, keeping productivity growth uh, steady. Um, the same has not been true for the others, uh, for the southern European economies, as we have said. So, I mean, essentially, uh, you know, if you really want to fill this gap between the southern economies and the northern economies, you don't have many, you don't have many options. You can, uh, for instance, uh, you know, keep, uh, say, productivity growth at a certain rate, say 0.7%. If you do so, essentially, the, uh, you're going to have that wage growth over the next five years uh, is going to be negative. Um, and this is uh, you know, needed in order to fill the competitiveness gap between the southern economies and the German economy. And of course, you know, if, you, if you have an economy where wages are going down by close to 3% each year, it's really difficult that you are going to end up with a GDP with a positive growth, of course. So this is really uh, uh, sort of feeding into uh, these uh, depressionary expectations. Alternatively, you know, these economies could try to introduce structural reforms, which they need to. And by introducing structural reforms and uh, you know, promoting more efficiency, uh, within their own economies, uh, you know, they, they can uh, become more competitive over time. However, even if they, uh, they're able to uh, keep their productivity growth rates at a premium vis-a-vis -vis Germany, so let's say that uh, Italy and Spain grow, their productivity grows at a rate of 2% over 0.7% of Germany, still we need that labor compensation to go down by 1.5% each year. So, I mean, it's better than 3%, but it is still negative growth. Alternatively, you can, uh, you can increase you know, labor compensation in Germany. So instead of 1.5%, uh, you know, that is the recent historical average, this labor compensation could go up, say, to 4%. And then, uh, you know, salaries would be, uh, I mean, they would not be growing. They would marginally decline, but, you know, within a, a, a more acceptable range. Or you're going to still have, you know, the best, uh, the, best, uh, the best case where, you know, these countries introduce uh, strong structural reforms they do uh, catch up on, uh, you know, much faster on productivity, uh, growing at a higher rate than Germany. And in that case, you know, the, you would, would have a sort of moderate wage growth. I mean, what, besides these simulations that are, you know, clearly oversimplified, but essentially the point is that in the current context of the Eurozone, it's really difficult to engineer a solution that is country-based. So these economies are so integrated that, uh, of course, the southern economies need to catch up in terms of uh, productivity, in terms of reducing their uh, wage cost. But it's very difficult for them to do so if this, this is not part of a coordinated macroeconomic framework. What uh, there has been so far in the Eurozone is essentially a framework where you, know, you have a, a centralized monetary policy, you have um, you know, a, a strongly enforced uh, fiscal policy framework, but essentially there is no macroeconomic coordination going on in a broader sense. And uh, you know, I, was, uh, I was at a conference uh, in Madrid uh, a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, and there was uh, uh, a German colleague of mine saying, look, really the problem for the southern economies is that they should engineer a growth-led model, a little bit like Germany has done. And I said, look, uh, this may certainly be desirable. Uh, certainly they need to become more competitive. They need to be able to sell their exports. But 
One thing is if you say that Greece which accounts for less than 2% of the Eurozone GDP has to engineer, has to export more. But if you have all the Southern European economies that have to export more, where are they gonna sell their products? To Mars? Because the Northern Europe has a huge current account surplus. So it exports more than it imports. The US, I read, that uh, you know, the US wants to become a little bit uh, more like China, so wants to, to, um, to have a more balanced current account at the very least. China still has a sizable current account surplus. The Gulf countries also have a sizable current account surplus. So, I mean, this is logically inconsistent. Uh, again, you can have a tiny island of Cyprus running a huge current account surplus, but this is true, you know, really at the margin you can't have a significant block of the Eurozone, essentially all exporting to nowhere. And I think this is really the, in a way, the contradiction in which Eurozone policymakers, you know, are falling every time they say that, uh, you know, the Southern economies have to do more. Of course they have to. And, you know, we have seen uh, their dismaying underperformance vis-a-vis -vis some structural variables. Um, labor costs, productivity, I'll show some other, just to reinforce this point. But the basic point is there will never be any catch-up if there is not an agreed-upon framework. And this is not really an excuse for not doing things, for not introducing reforms. Uh, clearly, you know, this coordinating framework has to be conditional. Germany or the northern economies could agree on uh, uh, you know, uh, being part of this coordinated framework, conditional on the implementation of uh, a wide range of reforms in the southern economies. So essentially, this would be very much akin to a, you know, a sort of contract that is being agreed by the countries of the Eurozone. And uh, uh, this is really where the, uh, the main issue lies and uh, where there's been really the least progress. Um, the problem is that, you know, whenever the situation seems to stabilize, um, then uh, European policymakers become complacent. Um, then, uh, you know, there is a, a new crisis and then uh, they get into emergency mode. So, you know, if you, last week they had Cyprus. Maybe, I don't know, in a few more weeks, there could be some other, some other countries in, in other parts of the Eurozone. So, uh, there has not really been an attempt to put the, um, to formulate an exit strategy in terms of a sustainable, a more sustainable approach, a more medium term approach, rather than really, uh, you know, intervening with the emergency measures. And, uh, Again, just to reinforce my point that uh, uh, the southern economies have a lot of catch up to do. This is uh, a survey that is done uh, on an annual basis by the World Bank and uh, it captures the ease of doing business. So essentially, you know, it's a very simple framework uh, that many have criticized, just to be fair. Uh, I don't mean to say that this is very comprehensive. But what they do is essentially they ask uh, people who work in the regulatory field of uh, roughly 180 countries, more or less, uh, how many days do you need to get electricity for your business? How many days do you need for registering property? Um, and then, you know, they, they rank countries based on uh, the responses they get. So this is, the latest, uh, this is the latest survey that was done last year, but it refers to this year. That's why you know, uh, it says to, um, 2013. Now look at Italy. It's 73, 73 out of you know, 180 or 160 countries. You know, Spain is 44. Germany is number 20. So really, there is a lot of catch up to do. And, uh, you know, there are some areas where, you know, Italy and Spain perform uh, particularly badly. In case of Spain really starting a business, 
it is 136. I'm sure that all the developing countries come before Spain uh, on this parameter. Uh, look at uh, Italy uh, dealing with the construction permits. It's a nightmare. Getting electricity, another nightmare. Getting credit, another nightmare. Enforcing contracts, it's almost last. So, uh, I mean, this really speaks for itself. So this is, these are really the results from the latest, uh, from the latest survey available, which, which is publicly, you know, publicly accessible. And uh, so those were the results from uh, um, you know, the um, um, 2012. So I decided to do a little bit uh, of a dig up and uh, see. It's true that Italy is 73rd. But what has been uh, the dynamics over the latest years? I mean, is there an improvement or there is a worsening trend? So I went, I went back to 2005 and you know, what I saw is that Italy was actually doing better. It was 64, now it's 73. Uh, and then the World Bank has uh, formulated this measure, it's called uh, uh, overall near nearness to frontier, which essentially capture the rate of improvement over time in making a regulatory environment more business friendly. So again, it's the worst performer. Uh, Spain is better, Greece, so and so. Germany actually, um, even I, there is a slight uh, uh, worsening. But you know, it's also true that uh, Germany starts from a very high base. So uh, you know, I don't think we should be very much concerned by that. So really, you know, if you look at these rankings, uh, you get a further confirmation that these countries uh, have been dormant in terms of improving their competitiveness. Uh, in terms of uh, keeping their uh, uh, wage uh, growth under control and in line with the productivity growth. They, they've also been uh, a little bit complacent in terms of uh, you know, improving their regulatory framework. And you know, countries, other countries have done much better. And this shows up uh, you know, in the statistics that we have seen in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, exports, current account surpluses. But the point remains that the Eurozone is a highly integrated area uh, from a financial, economic uh, and uh, uh, monetary standpoint. And therefore, and what we have seen is that there is a huge scope for contagion. So when you have a centralized monetary policy, when you have uh, a synchronized fiscal policy, essentially shocks you know, get transmitted very easily from one economy to the other. And this is why it is really in the interest, after all, of uh, the whole of uh, the Eurozone countries to try you know, to pull together, to pull themselves together and devise a, um, a more coordinated and uh, effective response um, to the crisis. But uh, one thing that I believe we have learned throughout these slides is that this crisis has really nothing to do with fiscal policies. If anything, fiscal imbalances are the expression, are the result, are the evidence of other diseases. And I hope that uh, you know, I have uh, pointed your attention uh, you know, towards uh, structural failures, towards competitiveness failures. And this is really where the attention should be focused in terms of, uh, um, in terms of really uh, solving the crisis. But this these are the areas where the least attention is being devoted right now. So. I believe I have used uh, you know, too much of your time, but uh, uh, I got so sort of interested in the presentation, so forgive me if I have uh, uh, spoken for too long. I didn't realize. Please. So, given this bleak picture of the Eurozone, what is your projection for 2025 for the Eurozone? 
Well, economists love to make projections, but we also know that they're always wrong. So, you know, uh, <laughs> so it's very easy, you know, to, to make a projection now. Um, I think what uh, we are seeing right now is that, uh, you know, compared to the earlier part of the crisis, uh, say, you know, 2011, when uh, market pressure was really escalating on Spain and Italy, now market pressure seems to have uh, abated. Um, and this is why, uh, you know, many in Europe were really celebrating success or victory. Actually, what is now happening is something uh, even more dangerous. Because until last year or so, you would have this uh, top-down pressure, you know, this uh, um, financial market pressure uh, that was reflecting in high spreads, high, high yields. But, uh, you know, that source of pressure, in a way, could, you know, um, could have been contained through a more aggressive uh, deployment of firewalls through a more aggressive monetary policy, as eventually, you know, has been the case. I think now it's much worse because, you know, again, if you take the case of Greece, they lost roughly 22% of income. The United States, under the Great Depression, lost 25% of income. If you take the case of Italy, I didn't compute the uh, loss of income, but you know, if you add up uh, this negative growth rate, 5.5% in 2009, last year minus 2.4%, this year maybe 2%, and who knows next year. You are already seeing that this uh, negative uh, growth dynamics is feeding uh, into uh, an electoral dynamics. So, uh, you know, in Italy there were elections uh, last month, and the first party who won the election was essentially a party that, uh, you know, had never been in parliament and uh, that had, had got, you know, uh, had been, uh, um, has been successful in running an explicit anti-euro campaign. So that was in February. Now, just uh, let's do some fast forward. What happens, say, next year or in two years if the economy keeps contracting at a rate between 1 and 2 percent every year? I mean, which party is going to support a pro-European agenda? This is true in Italy, but I think this is going to be true elsewhere. And I think this is, in a way, much more dangerous for uh, you know, the health of the euro, more than any speculative attack that we have seen so far. So, uh, I don't know, but... Uh, I am more worried by, uh, you know, this uh, el uh, disappointing growth results feeding into a negative uh, electoral dynamics. Please. Um, yeah, the, the very interesting article in, in uh, I've been working on balance and sustainability and trying to get countries to grow together. Very interesting article in the Wall Street Journal on Friday, which I think is highly in agreement with a lot of the things you're saying. And, and but they focused it by saying that Germany push the austerity because they're most concerned about banking stability. They can do the trade, they're, they're growing strongly, whereas the other countries really need that growth and they need to find ways to, to balance their trade and grow more than they consume. So, and I think... Yeah, uh, I mean... It's, uh, that's in, in keeping with, I think, yeah. with what you were saying. I mean, I haven't, read, I haven't read that article, but uh, I think we are now seeing the limits of uh, this very narrow approach to the European crisis. Uh, you know, there is the so-called debate on fiscal multipliers. Now, I'm not going to enter into the details, but essentially what we know is that uh, if a country is coming out of a recession, if households and firms have difficulty in, in accessing credits, then uh, fiscal consolidation is mostly depressive on growth in the short run. Look at the case of Italy. They've implemented uh, an extraordinary fiscal consolidation and look at what's going on. The debt to GDP ratio, as we have seen uh, escalated from 120 to 126 percent, this year is going to top 130 percent. If we go back uh, 
to history, you know when the debt to GDP ratio was higher in, in Italy, when uh, actually Mussolini took power. So uh, now I think, you know, it's, uh, the IMF is saying that. Um, earlier on, the IMF was much more quiet. Uh, now clearly, uh, you know, looking at data, they have recognized that, uh, I mean, the evidence uh, is just very strong. But, you know, in the end, uh, who decides are, uh, you know, Eurozone countries. Uh, the US uh, Treasury Secretary is uh, traveling to Europe, um, if not today, certainly in the next few days. He's going to talk again about, uh, you know, uh, re uh, reconciling austerity with growth. Uh, but in the end, you know, if you look at uh, the German public opinion or the uh, public opinion of some of the northern countries, um, you know, there is really, there is only so much you can do. And uh, um, I think, you know, many say that uh, if, uh, you know, in September, following the German elections, there is a social democratic administration, um, they might be more uh, sort of open uh, towards these issues. I, I don't think so, and you know, I'm saying this on the record, because in the end, a, uh, you know, an SPD German Chancellor or a CDU German Chancellor, they will have to, to make decisions based on the German public opinion. And whether it's from the center left or the center right, there is an extraordinary convergence. So I think we have to see a little bit more blood in the battlefield in order to convince that, uh, you know, the risk of uh, losing the euro uh, are so, uh, you know, is so high that maybe it's worth uh, experimenting more. If I were a German oh, policy... Let me, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. It isn't, the, isn't the euro as a concept which was a grand experiment, going to eventually become a grand failure. And that is based upon the fact that a consolidated currency, a, a monetary union without fiscal union or without credit union is going to end up not allowing countries like Cyprus and Italy and Spain's productivity to be reflected in a natural exchange rate. Um. Yes, that's very true. But uh, it's also true that, uh, you know, clearly you have sovereign nations uh, ceding their sovereignty voluntarily. And this is a unique experiment. So far, you know, I mean, until a few years ago, it only had pros, no cons. And therefore now the challenge is how to overcome, you know, this, uh, uh, these issues. Um, I mean, clearly we have no counterfactuals. Um, there are many, uh, there are some studies uh, that suggest that if Italy were to pull out of the Eurozone, it might be in a better shape. I mean, clearly these are kind of, uh, you know, assessment made, made under simplified assumptions in a kind of laboratory. But uh, it's also true that Europe has provided a, a unique source for modernizing the economies of, this, of Southern Europe. So, uh, I mean, really, uh, I don't know the answer, to be honest. Uh, but, uh, but I think that uh, right now the interests are so interconnected that however you think about the single currency, your first aim should be to try to save it, even if you may have disagreed. But my point, however, is that being pro-European or pro-Euro doesn't mean that you have to take for granted everything coming from Frankfurt or Brussels. <laughs> so, you know, Germany is a very large economy, roughly 30% of the Eurozone GDP. But it's not the majority shareholder of Europe. You know, other countries have, you know, slightly smaller economies, but, you know, there are still a significant uh, minority shareholders. And I think, you know, countries like Italy, Spain should be more uh, uh, dialectic in their relationship with uh, the Eurozone authorities. 
today, you know, just before coming down uh, to the editorium, I was reading an article on the Italian press saying that, you know, that France has been granted an exception because it's not going to make it, uh, it's not going to make the 3% uh, deficit to GDP threshold. So they have, apparently they have granted uh, France an exception. Although France is only going to balance the budget by 2017. And, you know, in Italy, there are firms that are going to bankruptcy because the state is not paying, uh, you know, is not paying its own debt. I mean, the money that it owes to these companies. Apparently, we're talking about um, 90 billion euros, at least 70 billion euros. This is a few percentage points of the Italian GDP. So, you know, you always talk about uh, creating new new companies. Here in Las Vegas, you are concerned about creating new startups. But, you know, in a country like Italy, I think the first emergency, item number one, should be really to save existing companies. Companies should not be allowed to die because they cannot get the money, you know, that the government owes to them. I mean, it's not that they are, they are dying, they are going to bankruptcy because they have to too much debt, they have too much credit, to the government, which is which is absolutely. Uh, but the problem is that if now the uh, government were to allow the payment for uh, you know all these uh, uh, arrears, the again the deficit to GDP ratio would increase, and therefore you know you have to kill more entrepreneurs in order to save you know this uh, threshold of. Uh, uh, you know, the 3% of uh, uh, deficit to GDP ratio. Uh, I think, yeah, this is partly the fault of Europe, but in the end, it's also the fault of the Italian authorities, that they need to go to Brussels and uh, be more um, dialectic, they, to leverage on their bargaining power, because after all, you know, if you are a small depositor, this is a problem for, for you, but if you are a a large debtor, you know, this might also be a problem for the bank. So uh, again, you should uh, fairly, but you should make this point. Sure. If, I was, and then you. if I was a European policymaker and I saw that last slide about increasing my wages by 4% a year to minimize the pain in the other countries, my first thought would be, well, that's wonderful, but all of my manufacturing base will now go to the United States, will go to Asia, go to, to Mexico where the wages aren't rising by 4%. So it seems like you're looking at Europe in isolation and not, not remembering that if Europe, Germany does that, they won't go to Greece and Italy, it's going to go to the United States, which is fine for us, and, and Japan and uh, China and Vietnam. Um, yeah, but this is, uh, you know, only true, you know, up to a point. In the end, uh, in Germany, there's a lot of uh, room for absorbing uh, imports. So clearly they are going to export, they might export less compared to what they import. But no one is saying that uh, the German competitiveness should be eroded. But just, you can't have a situation where countries are losing income by 20%, they are starving for demand, and then there are countries who save, you know, exceedingly. by any means, but I wanted to go back to uh, your discussion about Spain, about, um, sorry, Italy, with the, the government um, being more uh, fiscally conservative and cutting spending um, 3% and then um, the economy um, getting much worse. I've heard the argument that, that governments should actually spend more money rather than less um, to prevent this downward spiral, what would you recommend to governments facing um, these situations? Um, well, uh, certainly, you know, whenever there is, uh, whenever private demand is constrained, you know, what uh, textbook economics would suggest. I'm speaking under the control of uh, uh, my uh, academic colleagues here. Clearly, public demand should increase to uh, offset uh, the uh, falling private demand. However, it's also true that you know Italy does have an important uh, you know 
public finance issue. I mean, the debt is what it is. I think the problem in the case of uh, Italy and other countries has been really in uh, front-loading this fiscal adjustment. So, I mean, in the end, what, what really matters is that there is an horizon where, you know, you cut down your um, budget deficit, maybe at a lower rate, at a lower pace, but in a much more credible and sustainable way. My concern is that, yes, you maybe show your teacher or your professor that you have done your homework and you are really great. But maybe if you have not learned, if you have not grown up, maybe there is not much point. So, you know, I would like to see an economy where maybe the budget deficit this year is slightly higher, but nonetheless, you know, in a few years, the public finance situation is going to look much more sustainable because there will be less uh, families on the street and less entrepreneurs uh, who will have shut down their uh, enterprises. So it's really a matter of uh, pace, how you modulate the fiscal adjustment. Again, um, and I'm, I'm glad that you raised this point because, uh, you know, coming from Southern Europe, I don't have much credibility when I raise this issue vis-a-vis -vis my <laughs> Northern European colleagues. So they always think that uh, uh, this is a kind of excuse, but actually, you know, I want fiscal stabilization much more, you know, that maybe they are demanding for. And I'm concerned that after all these cuts, the debt to GDP ratio is rapidly escalating. So if the concern is about fiscal sustainability, now Italy is in a much worse situation than uh, it was when it began this fiscal consolidation. I'm sorry, I'm just going to draw sort of the public part of our program to close, but Domenico will be around uh, afterwards, happy to answer some more questions for you, but I want to keep us close to, to being on time. You have sure. a lot of credibility with us, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for coming and for your, your great questions. And uh, we'll be back here again quickly. We'll be back next week, uh, Tuesday evening. Uh, Domenico's colleague, Cliff Gaddy, will be out. We'll change our geography slightly. Cliff's an expert on Russia and is going to help us take a look at the Russian economy. And he, sh he will have just published, I think he'll be bringing some copies hot off the press with him of his new book on Mr. Putin. Uh, and you, if you can join us then, you're in for a real treat. So uh, Domenico will be around. Thanks again for coming. Hope we see you next week. Thank you.